Good morning. Welcome to the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain. We're here in room 89 with some of the most iconic works in the collection by one of the most trailblazing, most captivating artists in this collection and in the history of Western art. Of course, we're talking about none other than Goya. I'm Whitney Dennis with the American Friends of the Prado Museum, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting the museum with as many initiatives as we can alongside our sister organization, the Fundación de Amigos de Museo del Prado. And today we'll be looking at Goya's Marchioness of Santa Cruz. Now Goya is considered an extraordinary artist, one of the most extraordinary artists in the history of Western art for his technical brilliance, which would be enough on its own, but also for his innovative spirit, his humanity, and his critical observation of society. He was a pivotal figure in the transition to modern art, and he was enormously influential on subsequent artistic movements like Expressionism. The Prado Museum is home to more than 1,000 of his works if we add together all of his paintings and drawings and engravings. Here you can find his historical paintings, allegorical paintings, cartoons for tapestries, portraits, and sketches and notebooks, his personal correspondence. There really is just nowhere else in the world where you can delve into the life and the work of Goya like you can here at the Prado Museum. And today we'll be focusing on, on this portrait, the Marchioness of Santa Cruz. Her name was Joaquina Tellez Giron. She was a leading figure in the enlightened aristocracy of her time. And she was married to the first director of the Prado Museum. She was known for hosting intellectual and cultural get-togethers that would bring together some of the most relevant figures in society to engage in tertulia. Tertulia. This is the Spanish word for lively, good conversation and debate, usually with an artistic or a literary focus in a relaxed social environment. Joaquina was admired in her time for her beauty, but also for representing the ideal of an enlightened, educated woman. Her parents were the Dukes of Osuna, who were important figures in the Enlightenment as well, and important patrons of Goya. And there's a portrait here of the Dukes of Osuna with their children that we'll see. So this is another one of Goya's most iconic portraits, the Dukes of Osuna with their children. And again, we can notice an air of enlightenment. Notice the way that he's painted the children in a way that they look childlike. It would still be typical at this time to represent children in paintings as miniature adults, just small versions of adults. And here, they seem like real children, sweet, innocent, and playing with toys. There's warm physical contact between the parents and the children, which also speaks of the upbringing that the Dukes of Ozuna provided. And here, this young girl in the middle that we just looked at, the young girl in the middle is Joaquina. And remember those eyes, because I think we'll recognize them again when we go back to see her painted in the future. In the previous painting, she was about three or four years old. And here, in this portrait, she's 20 years old. So we're going to see how Goya paints her at age 20. She lies on a rich divan in an elegant white dress with a crown of leaves, a garland of leaves on her head, and the type of portrait that is common in neoclassical art, although Goya adds his own personal expressiveness. The garland that she wears on her head it signifies perseverance, strength, virtue, again, all references to enlightenment ideals. And in her left hand, she holds a lyre guitar. This was a popular instrument at the time, but this could also be a way that Goya tries to identify her with the muses, with one of the nine muses. It could be Terpsichore, who is the muse of dance and chorus, although it's not completely clear because Erato was another muse who was also um, connected with lyrical poetry. But it could also be that Goya didn't want to connect her with just one muse at all, but really just associate her with the general idea of muses and Joaquina's cultural affinities, and also show her as a muse in her own time. 
This is also a very sensual painting. Without being tight, the dress falls in a way that really reveals the contour of her body and leaves little to the imagination. She lies in a sumptuous setting of velvety cushions. And we can see the outline, for example, of her legs. You can see each leg, the outline of her legs. You can even see her belly button shows through in the dress. The lock of dark hair that falls down really stands out against her pale skin and it accentuates the low neckline of her dress. The painting as a whole may remind us of other paintings of Venus. We might think of Titian's Venus of Urbino, also called the Reclining Venus, or also Velasquez's Rokeby Venus, also called the Toilet of Venus. She married the Marquis of Santa Cruz five years before this was painted, so this would have been in their house. Now at this time, artists still needed an excuse to paint unclothed female anatomy, which is why they often looked to mythology to provide a context for female nudes so they could be blended, disguised with a mythological story that would provide a context that would make them acceptable. Now, Joaquina is not nude. This is not a nude, of course, but the sensuality of this painting might be another reason that Goya decided to paint her as a mute. Let's look at how Goya painted some of the effects of luminosity here as well. He used impasto, thick application of paint in a varied way to create effects of light. For example, on her thigh, we have this extra hand of white on her thigh to show how the light is reflecting off of this muslin or chiffon dress. And also notice the intense daub of white on her shoe. It's nothing more than a daub of paint. On the cushions, the artist decided to use lighter, quicker brush strokes and less paint to show how light uh, played on this velvety surface. And again, the treatment of these fabrics really evokes the tactile sensations that enhances, it adds to the sensuality, the delicate sensuality of the marchioness. And this is where we'll leave it for today. You can find out more about this painting and all about Goya on the Prado's website. We have all kinds of information. We have links to past conferences, uh, past exhibits, and all kinds of different information that you can find out. If you want to learn more about the American Friends who make this program in English possible, you can also go to our website, or if you prefer to speak Spanish, you can go to Fundación de Amigos del Museo del Prado. Thank you for joining today, and we'll see you again next Wednesday.